Not as exciting to turn on my record button because the heater is making noise this time. All right, well, hopefully you found that video interesting because we oftentimes talk about the Bandura study and it's kind of nice to see you know this old archival video of exactly what happened. Um, so some of the triggers that can lead to aggressive action would be things like imitation, right? The role modeling that we saw in the Bobo doll experiment being an example of that. Um, here's another study where they looked at um, preference for viewing violent television at age eight. Now I forgot, I was going to annotate this slide to show you exactly what year this was conducted. I think it was 1983 um, was the follow-up. So that means the original study was conducted at, in the 19, early 1960s. So what they considered a high violence TV show was Gunsmoke. Now if you've never seen Gunsmoke before, it's not a high violence TV show as measured by today's standards. Um, there were gunfights, but there was never any blood seen. There was nothing like um, the gun would go bang, the person would fall down, and then they'd be for sure dead. Like that was it. Um, there, it wasn't like things are today, and especially on cable or um, you know paid for cable kinds of movies and things like that. I just want you to have the context of the study. So um, they looked at what the child, the boy, they it was all boys in this study like to watch at age eight and they put them into three categories ones who like to watch low violent tvs like um you know back then they had uh kukla friend and ollie it was some kind of puppet show i don't know i'm i'm too young for that i'll just say um the medium level of violence and then the high level of violence viewers and then they followed them up they followed up with them when they were 30 years old and look to see what kind of criminal convictions that they had had um, by the time they were age 30. And so the percentage of the, of the people in each group who had been convicted of, of a serious crime. And what you see is that those who watched the, the least violent programming at eight were the least likely to have been um, convicted of a, a serious crime. The ones who watched the most violent TV at age eight were the most likely to have been convicted of a criminal crime, a uh, criminal conviction. Okay. So it looks like a nice linear relationship, right? The more violence I watched, the more likely I was to have engaged in violence by the time I was age 30. Um, the problem with this interpretation of this particular study is that there's a lot of other factors to consider. Like, um, first off, this is what we call a correlational study, where we found that these two things went together. You know, preference for violent TV went together with um, more criminal conviction. But we don't know why and we don't know how these two things are related. It's possible that the people who were already the most, had the, the most tendency towards violence at age eight were the ones who preferred watching violent TV. Like they already were violent and they liked the violent TV and then unsurprisingly by age 30 they had engaged in violence and gotten in trouble for it. I mean it's completely possible that some third variable is causing both what they watched when they were eight and you know how likely they were to have done something wrong by the time they were 30 and that variable could be something like their genetic predisposition or how their brain is organized or a whole bunch of other things. What the researchers wanted us to focus on is that maybe the children were imitating things that they had learned on the TV shows that they watched and that across life those became more and more solidified in their behaviors. So imitation directly from you know somebody in your life, direct imitation of people on TV, things like that. Um, now, I just really want to make sure that um, it's really clear that a lot of kids consume what could be construed as violent programming or violent um, messages, like maybe they play video games that are intended for their older teenage siblings, but they get to play them too, um, and never engage in any real life aggression. Uh, we have to be really careful about making the assumption that what, you know, monkey see, monkey do, right? Like I see violence, then I do violence. They did a study of little kids when Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles was new back in the 80s. People were very concerned that these turtles were doing ninja moves and that the kids would do them to their peers and actually hurt each other. What they found was in all the, in all the kids studied, with the exception of the youngest ones who were five, from six and above, they all did their ninja moves either in the air in front of their friend and if there was contact made it was accidental because they both put their legs up at the same time or something like that. 
or they did it to an inanimate object where they would like make their kicks and punches towards a tree or a car or something like that. The five-year-olds had a, a, a likelihood of actually trying to do the behaviors to someone, but the feedback that they got really shaped them away from that behavior when the other kid yelled ow or the adult said stop that don't hit you know things like that so very quickly the five-year-olds grew into the six-year-olds who knew not to do that um, so a lot of this concern that there will be just direct imitation is probably faulty let's talk about something more happy let's talk about how do we teach kids to be altruistic altruism means to do something nice for someone else with no expectation of reward um, we oftentimes call this pro-social behavior because you know there's this whole ethical debate about whether there's any such thing as true altruism. So I'll say there is such a thing as pro-social behavior, doing something nice for other people when you're not expecting anything in return. So where does it come from? Well, we start to see pro-social behavior in infancy, in little babies. Um, you know, my one and a half year old grandson got to meet his brand new newborn sister the other day, and she was making the tiniest little newborn cry. And he was so concerned for her. He came over, he kissed her on the forehead. He was very concerned about her. Um, my three-year-old was granddaughter was a little less interested in the crying baby, but the one and a half year old was like, holy cow, why is it crying like that? Um, from very early on, kids are definitely, babies are interested in, um, in, the, in the states of other people, right? Like especially people who they perceive as peers. Um, it requires a certain degree of empathy which is something that we have to develop into. Um, it's hard to have empathy for another person when you don't even look at yourself as an individual entity and you don't really recognize yourself in the mirror and things like that. You don't have a sense of self yet. So we think that it's somewhere around 18 months is when kids develop the ability for empathy because they have their own sense of, of autonomy and, and, and sense of self. So somewhere around 18 months is when we'll start to see kids displaying empathy. To experience true empathy, we are starting to realize that we need um, mirror neurons to be active. And so mirror neurons are this new um, explanation for how empathy can work. So I thought it'd be really helpful if you watch this video about mirror neurons. This is like six minutes and it doesn't explain every single detail, but I think it'll really help you to understand how these neurons help a person to put themselves into somebody else's um, mindset. So I'll see you on the other side of this video.